bored out of my mind. <laughs> they think you're crazy. So if you, quite frankly, if you get some experience from this meditation retreat, even if it's a little bit more peace, if you get nimitta experience or jhana, you're blown away. The biggest experience of your life. If you get an experience like that, your faith, confidence, and understanding of Buddhism will increase many, many fold. That is my aim of teaching these retreats. So people can actually see nimittas and get some understanding of the power of the mind. To get some, a taste of freedom and the bliss of enlightenment. To understand why people actually renounce, become monks and nuns for the sheer ecstasy of it. It's not a hard life being a monk or a nun. It's a blissful life. I'm doing this for fun. I couldn't be a monk for 30 years without having some fun. This is monk's fun. Deep meditation. So, I want to let people understand this. I also want to see if people can remember their past lives, to get such powerful meditation, superpower mindfulness, to actually recall who you were before. Because especially in the West, there's so many people say, no, the mind is part of the brain. When the brain dies, there's nobody left afterwards. It becomes a materialist society, selfish, no spirituality. And they don't believe in karma and rebirth. Evangelicals say, oh, there is no such thing as rebirth. You have one life, you go to God or you go to hell. And you Buddhists will go to hell. And you, if you have your own experience then you know, I'm sorry sir, you are absolutely wrong. But my book says my experience is much more important than any book. Which is true. You say, I know I've lived before. My experience, I can remember it. If more people had that experience, then obviously more people would become Buddhists or Hindus. They'd understand the law of karma and they wouldn't make such a mess of this world. If you knew, look, if Mr. Bush knew he'd have to come back to this world again, he'd make much, take much better care of it. He'd sign up to Kyoto if he had to live with the results. Every one of us, if we knew we were coming back, would be much more caring environmentally, socially, because we think we can get away with it. We're just here temporarily, so some people think. They just exploit this world and leave their children the mess. That is unfair. So I like people to remember previous lives. The more people remember it, the more people will once again, as they did before, understand reincarnation as a fact of life and work with it. You can still be a Christian and believe in reincarnation. It still all makes sense. It's just the evangelicals lose their power. Ah, oh, I'm taking the wrong path. I'm doing the same questions again. Next question is, okay, walking meditation. Dear Ajahn, I have a girlfriend who is often hit by her boyfriend who cannot control his anger. He, he even hit her during a meditation retreat in front of the venerables. Both are Buddhists. I have asked her to consider leaving him, but she said that it is her own bad karma. I think her understanding of karma is not correct, because she can still choose not to put up with the abuse and leave him. Please advise. Thank you. Amazing. I've never seen that happen. Someone <laughs> hit themselves. I've lived a very sheltered life. <laughs> No, of course, if there's abuse like that, you should not tolerate it in the sense of just uh, being too passive. If someone is abusing like that, that's a problem. It needs to be solved. Karma is always active. It's not just the fact that you did something in your past life, you have to receive this. What are you doing in this life? And that guy is doing bad karma himself, out of love for him. Make sure he doesn't continue to do such bad karma in front of the venerables. My goodness. If they do that in front of the monks, what would they do at home? So, 
somehow or other, you've got to, you have a problem there has to be dealt with. If you think the fellow can be changed with counseling, with good advice, trying to find the reason why he gets angry at you, to actually to make it quite clear that that is not appropriate in a, any sort of relationship, that's fine. But if it can't be solved, then you have to just draw a line under it and move on, move away. If you can do something about it, do it. If you can't, move away. It's the only way because you're allowing that guy to do more bad karma out of love for him, let alone for yourself. Move away. There's many other boys out there, many other nice soft boys, and if you go to a retreat, you meet the creme de la creme. <laughs> but don't start chatting them up until after the retreat, please. <laughs> I mean, if they did that in my retreat, I'd probably ask them to leave. Hey, our sixth sense consciousness, do they come under the third or fourth link of dependent origination? Sorry, I have to ask. Okay, the third link of dependent origination is the rebirth consciousness. And the rebirth consciousness uh, supports the Nama Rupa, which is uh, the objects of the consciousness. So the sixth sense consciousness is actually is the third of the, well, the third of the dependent origination is the sixth sense consciousness, but they also have after Nama Rupa Stala Yatana, which is also the six senses. So those particular aspects of the dependent origination, these are one and the same phenomena, looked at it different ways. You might see that the weight of this paper is also conditions that it's got sort of size, which also consider, uh, uh, conditions the fact you can write upon it. It's just one aspect of the same thing. So you have consciousness, the objects of consciousness, the six senses, contact, uh, feeling. Every experience has those. You can't have consciousness without an object of consciousness. You can't have an object of consciousness or consciousness without being at one of the six. You can't have it being one of the six without having contact. You can't have contact or any consciousness or objects of consciousness without an associated Vedana. So all these things are lumped together as aspects, indivisible aspects of one of the same experiences. In the same way you can say, Samatha Pachaya Vipassana, Vipassana Pachaya Samatha. Samatha Vipassana is similar, you can't have one without the other. Two sides of the same coin. Okay, next question coming up. Ajahn Brahm, it has been said that ours is a conditioned world, born of the four elements, and it is a play field of the mind. Nirvana is said to be the unconditioned, complete freedom. It has also been said that some fully enlightened ones do appear, come back from the unconditioned, when conditions warrant guide us. Is there any truth in this? It is said, because people say too much. <laughs> they say too much and they know too little. Which is why when you understand what the unconditioned means, you can't come back. It's the point of no return. Even less than that, if you're an anagami, you're a non-returner. So even at that stage you can't come back, let alone being an arahat. You go past the point of no return. You're gone forever. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, what was Buddha's last life before he was born in this world? Is this mentioned in one of the Kaya? Aha, that's an interesting question. According to the Jataka tales, which are read in places like Thailand and Burma and Sri Lanka, that those Jataka tales mention ten last births of the Buddha where he perfected the ten perfections, parameters, the last of which was dana, giving, which was the life of the prince Wisantara. However, that's a load of old baloney. I love getting into trouble. <laughs> because that, those jatakas were certainly written after the time of the Buddha. It's great these days that monks especially like Western monks, have actually started to question, 
question traditions. You're always supposed to question traditions, not just accept, oh, because it says in the commentaries, because it says this, it must be right. Not just because your teacher says it must be right. We have a tradition of critical analysis, which you have also accounted when you went to like uh, Catholic schools or Anglican schools when you were brought up. If you had an English education, you don't just believe what the teacher tells you. You're encouraged to question. And when you start questioning things, amazing things are seen. In particular, there is a sutta in the Majjhima called the Gatikara Sutta. Forget where it is there, but Gatikara. 80-something, I think. Not sure. Anyway. In the Gatikara Sutta, Gatikara was a potter in the time of Kasapa the Buddha. Kasapa the Buddha was the Buddha previous to Gotama in this very eon. So, in the cosmic scale of Buddhism, that's not that long ago. Gatikara had a friend called Jyotipala who was a Brahmin. Gatikara was a devout disciple of Kasapa the Buddha. In fact, Gatikara was an anagami, a non-returner. It described his life, which is wonderful to understand an anagami, how you can recognize him. The only reason why Gatikara didn't renounce and become a monk was because his two parents were blind without any other means of support. It shows that the compassion, if a person wants to become a monk and they've got a wife and kids or parents to support, I will not allow them to ordain under me. They've got to do their duties first of all. In the same way that Gatikara would do his duties to his blind parents. But because he was an anagami with none of those defilements, look how he lived. He was a potter. He would not dig the earth in case he would injure any sentient beings. He would wait for the leftovers from the paddy fields when the farmers would make their dikes and he'd use that earth. Or he would use the clay which was dug up by rabbits or mice. He was so pure he'd only use leftover pre-dug clay. And when he made his pots he would not sell them. He put them on a table outside his hut with a sign, if anybody wanted a pot, please take one for free. It's just like our books for free distribution. And he said, if anyone wants to leave a donation of rice or curries, you can just leave it. He didn't go into trade bartering. He didn't have any money. He just had his pots he made and people just leave some rice, leave some lentils, so he could make a curry for his parents. That's how pure-hearted he was. He always wore white. He didn't have a wife. You can see that he was, this is like, almost like living as a monk. Even though he hadn't ordained, he was basically a monk. Because he was an anagami, non-returner. Now his friend, Jyoti Pala, was not into religion at all. At least not into Buddhism. So whenever Gatikara said, Kasapa, the Buddha Kasapa is giving a talk tonight, come along. He said, who wants to see that bald-headed fool? Jyoti Pala abused Buddha Kasapa. He called him names. And it was only after many tricks that Gatikara managed to connive, deceive almost a Jyotipala into going into the presence of Kasapa. He thought that once my friend actually sees Kasapa, the Buddha, I'm sure he'll get faith, which he did. So Jyotipala heard the first teaching of Kasapa, the Buddha, was so inspired that became a monk under Kasapa, the Buddha. And the story of Jyotipala finishes there as we go on to what happened to Gatikara afterwards. At the end of that sutta, told by Gautama the Buddha, he said a very astounding thing. He said, that was me in my previous life. I was Jyotipala the Brahmin. And that is confirmed in the Sangyuta Nikaya, in the Dewaputa Sangyuta, where just after Gautama Buddha's enlightenment in Bodhgaya, 
the Deva, Gatikara, now died, now an Anagami from the pure abodes, came to see Gautama the Buddha. And in a poem said, We used to be in the same village in the time of Kasapa. Now you are the Buddha Gautama, where I am the Deva from the pure abodes, Gatikara. To me, it's almost certain that that was the past life of the Buddha, as told in the suttas, as told by the Buddha himself, because that is very, very recent. What is also interesting, this is why I like to be controversial, because being controversial makes people think. There's an old saying in the West, where everybody thinks the same, no one thinks at all. <laughs> where everyone thinks the same, no one thinks at all. Because it's very likely that was the previous life of the Buddha. Now, when the Buddha was under the Bodhi tree, after, this is the Buddha-to-be, after he got the jhanas, what's the first insight he got? His previous lives. That was the insight which he got in the first watch of the night. Imagine you had a previous life, in cosmic terms, not that long ago, when you were a monk with the previous Buddha. Wouldn't you remember what that Buddha taught you? Wouldn't you remember the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination? Was it true that the Buddha discovered these things? Or was it that he remembered them? He recalled them from a previous life when he was taught those teachings at the feet of Kasapa the Buddha. What do you think? It also shows us a bodhisattva, a being who is soon to become a Buddha. It describes them in a lifetime very, very close to their final attainment. A person who is soon to be the Buddha, Jyotipala, was not wise, was not even compassionate, but couldn't recognize a Buddha when there was one in that life. Jyotipala, a Buddha-to-be, soon to become a Buddha, couldn't even recognize a Buddha and even said terrible things about him. Now you understand what a Bodhisattva is. You could be a Bodhisattva. You're not pure. You can be very close to being a Buddha. They're ordinary beings. They're not all that attained. It's a very powerful sutta which really makes you think and to question some of the received knowledge. Look it up, Gatikara Sutta in a Majjhima Nikaya. G-H-A-T-I-K log A-R-A. Walking meditation. Is there any signs or feelings we get to tell us that we are treading, oh, that we are doing it correctly? Just like we get in sitting meditation. Yes, the things which you get are peace, happiness and freedom. If when you're walking meditation you're becoming happier, more peaceful, more still. And you feel that burdens are falling away from you. You feel so free, you're light, you're just floating along and you're doing it correctly. The signs of successful meditation. Freedom, happiness, uh, lightness, increased mindfulness. In other words, your mindfulness becomes powerful. You know you're doing it correctly. Next question. A friend's father-in-law passed away recently. He was cremated. Two instant incidents happened. Interesting. The top part of his skull was not burned. Sticking to it were coloured stones, many blue-coloured ones. On her way to the memorial park, she heard music in her ears. It came to a stop on reaching the park. This music could be heard even through a chanting tape was being played in the car. Kindly explain what had happened. Who knows? It could have been someone playing music in the house. So it's really hard to say. But you have to find out who your father-in-law was, whether he's a really nice person, a good person, because some part times these things are just natural occurrences because the fire wasn't properly put. Sometimes part of the skull was not burned. There might be coloured stones from all over the place. But that doesn't really mean anything. You know that sometimes, I don't know if you've been to natural cremations, because in Thailand, our monastery was 
the local cabinet.